Welcome to lecture 7.3, where we are going to be talking about MongoDB performance and architecture. In this video, we are first going to demonstrate the great impact that indexing can have on improving performance in MongoDB. And then in the second half of the video, we'll look at replication in MongoDB. In order to demonstrate the performance implications of indexing, we actually needed a much larger data set than what we have imported in the previous videos. So I went ahead and loaded the traffic violation data set we used in an earlier video to demonstrate HBase regions. This data set is about 700 meg and contains a little over 1.6 million records. Now, by default, MongoDB does not show us the time it takes to execute a query, but we can ask for this information by adding .explain execution stats on the end of our query. So I'm going to go ahead and flip over to our MongoDB server and we'll start looking at how this all works. So first of all, I'm going to launch the Mongo client and connect to my mg underscore uhdb database. I say show collections. We see the uh, traffic collection that I just imported. If we do db.traffic.find, we see that we have a whole bunch of data here. Uh, if I were to say db.traffic.count, we see uh, we have 1,677,802 documents in this collection. And like most databases, MongoDB does automatically create an index on the unique identifier, in this case, this underscore ID field. So if I were to say db.traffic.find and the search criteria was where your ID is equal to this uh, object ID that I've just kind of randomly selected here. Um, Oh, I don't need quotes around that. See, that returns uh, pretty quickly, but if we wanted to see just how quickly, we can say explain execution stats, and we get a lot of information back about how this query was executed, but what we're most interested in right now is this uh, value for execution time milliseconds, which in this case is zero. Finding this one particular document out of uh, over a million and a half documents took less than one thousandth of a second for MongoDB. That is some very uh, impressive performance. However, if we wanted to search on another field, one that's not automatically indexed, um, for example, there is a field that describes whether alcohol was a part of this traffic violation, and that's just called alcohol. If we wanted to find documents where, that have a value of yes for alcohol, we can see that took a bit longer than, than a millisecond. Um, and in fact, when we scroll up, we can see that took 1037 milliseconds, which is just over a second. That's quite a bit slower. But if we know that we're going to be searching on this field, alcohol, frequently, we can create an index and dramatically improve the performance. So we're going to do that by saying db.traffic.insureindex, and then what field we want to create an index on, in this case, alcohol. And when we do this, it's going to take MongoDB just a second to sort this out. Okay, and we now have an index created on this alcohol field. And if we run this same search again and get the execution stats, we see that came back much faster this time. And in fact, we went from over a thousand milliseconds down to merely five milliseconds. So a dramatic improvement in the performance on this query because we created an index on that field. Now, if we want to see all of the indexes that exist in our database, we can say uh, db.traffic.getindexes. 
and you see that this uh, database or this collection has two indexes, one on the underscore ID field, and now this new one that we've created on the alcohol field. Okay, so if we wanted to get rid of an index, we just say db.traffic.drop index, and then the name of the index that we created. Okay, and now that index is gone. And if we run this query that started out slow and then got fast after we created the index, we can see that it is now back to being quite slow, taking a little bit over a second to find all of the traffic violations where alcohol was involved. So clearly indexing can be a really great benefit to your MongoDB server. Of course, there are some trade-offs. When we create an index, this actually does consume disk space because uh, MongoDB is going through and finding all of the values for that alcohol field or whatever field we're creating an index on and basically creating another table to do a quick lookup in. So some disk space is consumed. Uh, it also takes some CPU time to create the index. And we saw that when we created it, it took uh, maybe one or two seconds. Um, however, if we were creating a more complex index or if our database had uh, hundreds of millions or even billions of, uh, of documents, uh, it could take significantly longer. And so uh, generally creating an index is something that we want to do during the off hours. And this index is going to need to be refreshed as new data comes in. Uh, and then finally, we have to create an index for each field that we want to perform the, or that we want to improve the performance of. So we may actually have to create many uh, indexes if we have a lot of different fields we're going to be doing searches on. And now for our final topic on MongoDB, we're going to talk about clustering. So in MongoDB, replica sets enable MongoDB to replicate data to multiple servers. And in a MongoDB replica set, we have one primary server and any number of secondary servers. Now only the primary server is writable. However, users can read data from all of the servers. One thing to note is it is best to have an odd number of servers in your cluster. That way, if there is a network failure, it's more likely that uh, servers will be able to figure out where the clear majority is. And this is related to partition tolerance and the CAP theorem. So for example, imagine we had a network partition when we had four nodes in our cluster. Well, the cluster could be split two nodes and two nodes, and then neither resulting group is able to determine that they have a clear majority and actually both sides are going to shut down. On the other hand, if we had a cluster with five nodes and had a network partition, it's likely that we're going to have an imbalance. So we'll have either one node and four nodes or two and three or something like that. And therefore the cluster is going to be able to identify a clear majority and all the servers in the minority are going to shut down and the ones in the majority uh, of the remaining cluster are going to remain active. Now in this demo, all of the MongoDB instances are going to be running on one server, but the same principle applies if you're running on multiple servers. So if you have deployed your own instance of MongoDB in AWS, you should be able to follow along with this example. Uh, however, if you're just connecting to our shared environment, you're not going to have the rights to uh, spin up these new instances of MongoDB. So in that case, this is just really uh, more something to watch and kind of follow along with. Uh, also, one thing to note, we're not going to cover sharding in this class, but in principle, it works very similar to how sharding works in a relational database management system. So with that, let's go ahead and connect to our MongoDB server and get some replica sets up and running. So what we have here are four connections to our MongoDB server. On three of these connections, I'm going to be running an additional instance of MongoDB server, and in the Fourth, it's going to be our client that's connecting to the cluster. So this first window here is uh, going to be the first instance of MongoDB in our replica set. The second is going to be our second member of the replica set. And the third is our third member of the replica set. So we're launching MongoD, the Mongo daemon, with a replica set, in this case named Rep Demo. 
and a database path, we're storing this in a basically a directory or folder called Mongo1 and running on port 27011. And the second one, it's uh, the same replication set, but we're storing the data in a different directory and we're running MongoDB on a different port. And the third, also part of the replica set, RepDemo, but storing the data in a different path and running the server on a different port. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter to start each one of these up. And we're gonna see a bunch of text scroll across as each one of these instances of MongoDB comes online and it's kind of trying to sort out what it needs to be doing. And we've told them all they're part of this replica set. However, we haven't connected to the servers and defined uh, what that replica set is supposed to look like. So uh, that's what we're going to do from the Mongo client over here. I'm gonna launch Mongo client and connect just uh, kind of randomly to, uh, to one of these three servers. In this case, the one that's listening on port 27011. And when I hit enter, we should see some uh, activity in this window here showing our connection coming through. All right. And what we are going to do now to initiate the replica set is to run this rs.initiate command and say this replica set has an ID of rep demo. And here are the three uh, member servers of this replica set. So when I hit enter here, we're going to see the three servers uh, kind of negotiate and try to figure out who is going to be the primary and what servers are going to be the secondary. So we hit enter, see some scrolling across here. We can see at the moment, well, they've all said they're secondary and it appears I'm connected to the secondary, but uh, okay, now I think they've, they've worked it out. And in fact, I am connected to the primary uh, server in this MongoDB replica set. So if I said something like db.isMaster.primary, and we see that it is the uh, server that's running at port 27011. Sorry, I accidentally exited out of the Mongo client there, but at this point I could uh, just say something like show collections and see that there are currently no collections, but I could insert data just like any other MongoDB instance. Uh, so I could say something like db.students.insert and then uh, this data about students and then say show collections and see that uh, we do have, uh, have that there now and we can read that back out. Uh, let's insert just a couple of more students here. Right, and so we have the same student data that we were talking about in a previous video. Now, here's the big question is, what happens if our primary server were to go offline? And so what I'm going to do here is just uh, go to my primary server and hit Control C to kill the uh, Mongo daemon. And you can see the other two servers kind of working things out a little bit and they're going to continue to scroll messages across and complain because they're upset that uh, one of the servers in the cluster is uh, is missing. But now uh, actually my connection here is uh, dead. So I'm going to need to connect to one of the other servers. And yeah, it just so happens that 27012 became the primary. And at this point, the data should have replicated between these MongoDB uh, instances. And indeed, we do see our students collection here. Uh, if we were to say db.students.find, we uh, see all of the data that we had uh, inserted on the server that is now offline. So that's it for our discussion of MongoDB. I hope you found all of this valuable and with this knowledge, go forth and do great things.